Public Speaking Project presents Using Reasoning Effectively by Lisa Schreiber, Ph.D. Voice Talent by Jillian Sabarbro, with Morgan Hartramp as the Media Production Specialist. When you decide to back up the hard drive on your computer because your computer is getting old, you are using reasoning to keep from losing your documents, photos, and your music. When you decide to wait until tomorrow to ask to take your vacation because your boss seems like he is in a bad mood today, you are using reasoning to increase your chances of getting time off. When you start to eat less fried food and more vegetables because your doctor has told you your blood pressure is too high, you are using reasoning to improve your health. We are confronted with a variety of choices every day, and generally the choices we make are driven by our patterns of reasoning. Reasoning is the act of forming conclusions, judgments, or inferences on the basis of evidence and logical thinking. The evidence you use when making decisions may include statistics, facts, expert testimony, or real-life examples. As a speaker, using facts and evidence to move an audience is what Aristotle calls logos. Effective reasoning is critical in public speaking because in order to be able to convince your audience of something, you must first show them the steps you took to reach your conclusions. Sound reasoning not only helps you to be more persuasive, it can also help you to clarify your points and make them more memorable. Unfortunately, in this module, we don't have time to cover all of the aspects of logic and reasoning. However, you can find an entire chapter about critical thinking and reasoning in our free textbook, Public Speaking, the Virtual Text, at www.publicspeakingproject.org. The purpose of this module is to help beginning speakers learn about the primary types of reasoning that can be used in persuasive speeches. Here we will focus on six reasoning strategies you may use to make your persuasive speeches more effective. There are six major ways to structure arguments to help listeners reach logical conclusions. These strategies include deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, causal reasoning, reasoning by analogy, reasoning by sign, and reasoning by authority. Let's begin with deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning, also known as reasoning from principle, is when the speaker bases her claim on some premise that is accepted by the audience. A premise is a statement that is assumed to be true. Deductive reasoning can be mapped out in the form of a syllogism. A syllogism contains a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. So, for example, look at this classic syllogism. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Now let's examine a more common form of the argument. Say you are at a party and you hear Sam telling Sally that she should let him drive because she has had too much to drink. He is using deductive reasoning, and if we put the unstated portion of his argument in the form of a syllogism, it would look like this. People who drive drunk get arrested for drunk driving. Sally is drunk. Sally will get arrested for drunk driving. The key to using deductive reasoning is to make sure that your audience agrees with your major premise and that your major premise is valid. So, when speaking to a group of U.S. citizens, you can be relatively sure that they would agree with the assertion that people have a right to freedom of speech. They may not, however, agree that women should have the right to an abortion, that humans evolved from apes, that lowering taxes will help the economy, or that a vegan diet is good for you. So, it is a good idea to have plenty of evidence to support your major premise. You may also need to have evidence to support your minor premise, because the specific case you cite may not be self-evident. Your audience may agree with the major premise that the United States should lead the war on terrorism, but they may not agree with the minor premise that Afghanistan is a terroristic threat and thus the conclusion that the U.S. should invade Afghanistan. In order to test the soundness of a deductive argument, you should ask, 1. Will the audience accept the major premise of the argument? 2. Is the major premise valid? 3. Do you have evidence to support your major and minor premises? 4. Have you explained the link between your major and minor premise? The second major type of reasoning is inductive reasoning, which is also known as reasoning from specific instances. If your friend claims, 
Dorm food is awful. It's bad here. It stinks on my brother's campus, and even my mom said the food at her school was bad when she went to college. He is reasoning by induction. With this form of reasoning, you argue what is true of certain members or objects of the same class, but must also be true of other members of the class or be true of the entire class. When you are using inductive reasoning, you build from a collection of specific cases or observations to a final conclusion. This type of reasoning can be seen in instances when a population is sampled, as in a Gallup poll, the Nielsen TV ratings, random drug testing, and quality sampling at a production plant. When you use this form of reasoning, you are making a generalization based on specific types of evidence, like from a sample of a product. Say you are in a grocery store, and a nice little old lady lets you try two cookies to entice you to buy a package. If you liked the cookies, you would conclude that all of the cookies in the package tasted just as good. You don't need to try them all to come to that conclusion. With inductive reasoning, you need to be cautious in making your claims because no matter how many cases you present as evidence for your claim, it is always possible that there are exceptions to the rule. For instance, many people may agree with the claim that all mammals give live births. However, the platypus is an exception to this rule, as they are a species of mammal that lays eggs. To test the strength of an inductive argument, you should ask: One, are there enough examples to reliably predict a general trend or characteristic? Two, are the sample cases relevant to the general claim? Three, are the examples typical or representative of the class of objects about which the claim is being made? Four, are there critical counter examples? The third major type of reasoning is causal reasoning, wherein one argues that one condition or event brings about another condition or event. In this form of reasoning, you can either move from cause to effect or from effect to cause. The claim that running a car with no oil will result in bent or damaged engine rods is reasoning from cause to effect, pointing out that Steve received an A plus on his exam, therefore he must have studied hard, is moving from effect to cause. In this form of reasoning, you must be very careful, as complex social, political, or psychological problems are never caused by just one thing. There are usually a number of interrelated causes contributing to a problem. So, for instance, if a presidential candidate argues that the current budget deficit is caused by mismanagement of the current administration, he may be ignoring the impact of the previous administration's contributions to the current economic conditions, or the impact of foreign economies on the U.S. economy. Reasoning from cause means that you must establish with certainty the link between one variable and another. For example, a speaker needs to show that the leading cause of heart disease is high cholesterol versus other contributing conditions such as smoking, stress, or diabetes. Furthermore, the cause and effect should also vary together. So, reducing one's cholesterol will reduce the risk of heart disease. Or, if a person who commits one armed robbery gets sentenced to five years in jail, then a person who commits four armed robberies gets sentenced to twenty years in jail. Effective causal reasoning also means that you should not confuse cause with coincidence. If a speaker makes the claim that ice cream consumption causes an increase in the murder rate, he is missing the true cause of an increased murder rate, namely the hot weather. That people eat more ice cream when the weather is hot is just coincidental to the increase in violent crime. To test the soundness of a causal argument, you should ask one. Is the cause capable of producing the desired effect? Two, do the cause and effect vary together? Three, is the relationship ongoing or is it a one-time cause or effect? Four, could some other cause produce that desired effect?